Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, the Calgary Flames are starting to come back around and we're seeing their winning ways again. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. Uh, Matt, it's the start of a road trip and I guess good to see the Flames putting some points up. Yeah, the Flames played rather well all week, even though they did lose the game to Tampa Bay. And, you know, it, it everything over the last couple of weeks has been trending in the right direction and just hope to see more. For sure. Uh, Let's talk about those games. The first one of the week was the last home game for the Flames before they started their season-long six-game road trip. And the LA Kings, who, you know, it's kind of in the background. The Kings are becoming one of the Flames' biggest rivals. Um, It seems like everyone gets up for those games. But the Kings were in town. Um, They they came to town to play the Flames. And I think maybe part of that rivalry comes from the old Daryl Sutter coaching days there. The Calgary Flames end up winning 6-5. to in one period alone, the Flames had a goal from every line. Yeah, the the game itself uh, was very much uh, a tale of two games. Like once the Flames got up uh, and built a huge lead, they kind of stopped playing quite a bit, and uh, like they were overpowering LA uh, in the first forty minutes, and. Like, if it wasn't for Jonathan Quick, like, it could have easily been 10, 12, 14 to 2 uh, at that point. And he, he literally made, like, six or seven highlight reel saves against the Flames in this one. And, you know, the Flames uh, sat back in the third period, and L.A., to their credit, drew within a, a single goal, but just ran out of time on the score clock. Yeah, and and I think um, you know that's maybe the fortunate thing for Calgary is that LA ran out of time because Calgary. I mean, after the first period, the Flames were I would say running away with this game both on the score clock and on the ice. It was what four to two after the first period, and then LA fought back. And I think this was this was a game where the the Flames maybe let their foot off the brake a little bit, or sorry, let their foot off the gas a little bit at the end. Yeah, and that's one of the things that has been plaguing this team. Uh, anytime they've had a lead this season, uh, they just stop playing for a little while, and one bad thing will happen, and then it'll spiral very quickly out of control. And like we saw that the last time we played Edmonton, where like the Flames dominated the game until like there was like seven minutes left. McDavid scored a weak goal, and they lost their minds for three minutes and ended up losing the game. And Calgary, at least in this one, had enough of an insurance a four goal lead uh, that just proved to be too much to give up. <laughs> for sure, mind you, yeah, if it, mind you, if the game had gone on another three or four minutes, it probably would have been tied up with how they were playing. Yeah, I think that's fair to say for sure, um, and. Yeah, that's one of those times. We don't see this too often, thankfully, being Flames fans, but this is one of those times I was glad that the game ended when it did. You know, you're just kind of waiting for it to end because you were worried about, like you said, if it goes too long, the Flames would would get themselves into trouble. Yeah, and uh, I think that it's just a lot of lack of mental focus overall on the team uh, where... Like last year, the Flames uh, very much got into a comfortable routine when they got up and effectively shut the other teams down. And I think it's just due to the fact that like there are too many new people on too many new lines that everybody is still a little bit off and out of sync. Um, that it's causing them not to be able to be able to fully shut down like they normally would, even though they're still excellent at limiting the other team on generating a lot of scoring chances. Like, um, in the game against LA, uh, LA only had seven high danger scoring chances and yet they put in five goals. And it's one of those where when they're more in sync, whether it's the goaltender or the team defense that, you'll start to see less overall with just how the team's playing. It's just too many blatant mistakes, whether it's the goalie's fault or the defense's fault that's allowing too much in. 
Matt, you know, and I mean, we won't take the rest of the the week into consideration at this point, but I find it funny looking at this game and the guys who scored. I mean, Jonathan Hubero scored in his first game back, which is awesome. But at this point, Brett Ritchie and uh, has more goals than Huberto does. And he and Huberto's tied with Ruzicka. Like when you're looking at guys who should be lighting the lamp, you should not have Brett Ritchie have more goals this season than Huberto. Well, to me, it, this is, is not really a surprise, even though, um, like, it's certainly disappointing. And, like, he is having a rough start to the season. But um, watching a lot of Panthers games, uh, knowing what type of guy that uh, Huberto is, he is very much like a, a surgeon with his passes. And, like, everything is meticulously placed and instinctually he knows where everybody is and it's one of those where because of the fact that he's learning both a new system and uh, his new line mates whether it whichever line it is he doesn't know where anybody is properly and so he can't just instinctually fire passes off right through like eight people's legs right through to the guy that he's wanting for the tap in like he you know like you can just look at any highlight reel with florida and you can see the caliber of passes that he's able to make but he needs to know where the guys are instinctually to fire those passes off and so like he's just kind of all over the place trying to learn so his struggles yeah but brett richie's also been playing with new guys this season yeah well how would you say brett richie is a very linear player where he just he he crashes he bangs and he goes to the front of the net and if there's a puck there yay (laughs) and you know like he's you're he's not a creative type guy um huberdo is very much in the same mold as guys like christian who's alias like alex tangay um like johnny goudreau where you know it's a lot more in the mind uh play instead of just instinctual and I feel like uh, if I'm Huberto's agent at this point looking at this, I'm going, Jonathan, it's good we got you your deal last summer. Yeah, honestly, I, I think it's overblown. and I, I agree. I'm I'm being silly. Oh, I know. It, it's one of those things that, like, if we're talking, like, in uh, February, March, and, like, he has, like, 30 points by then, then it's like, um, dude, uh, where'd you go? <laughs> but um, right now, it, it's one of those where... It, he missed a bit of time. He played through some injuries. It's new everything. And, you know, to his credit, he's looked good with Backlund and Coleman. Um, Let's I, come back to that thought. Uh, it's one of those things also, like, if you look at um, his uh, starting on the first line, um, both uh, Lindholm and uh, Toffoli are very uh, linear north south type guys like they're not overly creatively dynamic with the puck themselves and like they relied on like whether it was kachuk or to foley like they relied on gaudreau to be like the dynamic guy on that line and huberto is not that type of dynamic guy he's more of north south himself so it might just be a chemistry issue where you have too many guys that play in the same styled but not in a complimentary way so well let's look ahead to the next game which was the first of this six game road trip for the flames and what we would and the sort of i guess the eastern leg of their eastern trip uh going way down to florida and the calgary flames took on the tampa bay lightning and what have to be one of the worst jerseys in the nhl this year is the lightning wore their reverse retros Oh come on! You 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 don't like the weird storm white storm effect on it? Like you know, it has rain and lightning bolts. On I it. I didn't mind the storm thing when the whole jersey was dark, but having these dark sleeves and white body, it almost looks like in baseball when the guys wear sleeves under their jersey. I don't know. It just it looks like a bunch of pieces that somebody's kid cut and paste onto a new jersey. Well, that's pretty much the whole reverse retro program. Like, there's only a couple that are actually good. Like, the Penguins jersey. Like, most of the other ones are just awful. (laughs) 
Well, not only were, is the jersey awful, uh, the result was awful for Flames fans. The Calgary Flames ended up losing 4-1 to one against the Lightning here. This is a frustrating game. I think for me, when I look at this one, the Flames need consistency from their top guys. And I thought that after that L.A. game, while they played an okay game, they just didn't have the consistency from their top forwards yeah, and defensemen. Yeah, it's one of those where... You know, and I I hate blaming one guy, um, but like this was mostly Jacob Markstrom's fault. Um, When Lucic scored, and then it was called back to give up a goal like 30 seconds later, it deflates the team. Then, you know, they go down to nothing. That's fine. Then they finally manage to draw within one. They look like they're poised to tie the game. And literally 10 seconds later, he allows a goal that literally any goalie at any level should stop with ease. And it's like, and then the Flames just kind of petered out from that point forward. And it's like two times in that game, you needed the goalie to make a decent save. And, you know, or in the second one, just make the save. And, you know, so the rest of the team can build, you know, like the Flames, like when Lucic scored, they looked like they were more in control of the game than not. Then they allow the quick goal and like things have spiraled a bit. Then they get back in there and then the goalie immediately lets them down again. And it's one of those where it's been a repeating theme this season with Markstrom. And he just needs to be a lot better than what he's currently doing. Yeah, and, and he's one of those top guys I was mentioning. I think him, I thought the top couple lines, while they played okay, they just didn't look as good as they needed to. Yeah, and, I agree. And you can't win when you're you know playing well, then you're just kind of there, then you're playing well, then you're there. I think, And I think this is one of the issues we saw in the playoffs last year too, is some games the Flames came looking ready to play, and other games they came looking like they had to be there. And... You've got to have that consistency. You obviously can't play your top game every night, but you've got to be more consistent than that if you're going to be a top team in this league. Yeah, like you, you can't be a nine and a half out of ten one night and then a four the next. Like you have to at least be a six and a half, seven out of ten. Exactly. And when you, I think about the top teams the last couple of years, I mean, I think of teams that were always looking good. You don't think back to, oh, yeah, there's that stinky game from that team or. Well, you look at like the Boston's and the Chicago's and L.A. previously, Pittsburgh, Washington. Like, even when they're not having a great game, they're still good, and you have to be on your toes to actually beat them. And y- you know, like you look at Boston, just like basically for the last fifteen years, and like there have been periods where they've been not great, but. Like they've been fairly consistently like they're they got a certain level that you have to play at if you're gonna get two points. And Calgary, it's literally up and down. Which, you know, like even last year the Flames weren't like this discombobulated. But no, they it, weren't. but you know, it, it's one of those that usually it takes two months for teams to sort out all the new people and fit them in properly. So hopefully that growing pains part of the season is coming to an end soon. And (laughs) this kind of stuff will go away. And the last game we're going to recap is the one that I was most looking forward to this week. Um, I think the one that had the most storylines going into it and maybe the second worst Jersey of the week being worn against the flames the Calgary Flames went to Florida to play against the Florida Panthers and of winning this one 5-4. to four. I just want to make a note here that uh, Matthew Kachuk did not score in the shootout, and we did. And you could tell that Markstrom just stared him down after that shot, so I thought that was hilarious. Yeah, it's um, like, I got your puck right here, buddy. <laughs> you know, exactly. Man. Calgary did a good job keeping Florida the outside and keeping them away from shooting, I would say, high-danger shots on Markstrom here. This was Rajishka's first ever career three-point game. And I thought good emotion on both sides. And when I watched this, I thought to myself, maybe that's what the Flames have been missing here. And we've, you know, we talked about some of the challenges in the last couple games. It doesn't feel like they've had a lot of emotion this year. 
No, and I think that's due in large part to everybody learning how to play with each other because there are just so many new people that, it, and it's hard to say fight for your teammate when it's like, oh, I've known this dude for like two weeks. <laughs> and it's like, it, you know, it's hard to, you know, it, it takes a bit to get that chemistry going and, you know, the all for one, one for all camaraderie. And it's getting there, and you can start to see elements of it more so than like right at the start of the year. But it's still a ways to go. The Flames have a history of not doing well in matinee games. So I was a little bit worried going into this one, just the fact it was a matinee game. But this was a fun game to watch. And I think of all the games this year, this stands out in my mind. And maybe it's just because it was the last game we saw, but this stands out in my mind as really being one of the more fun games to watch this season. Yeah. Whenever we're in Florida, for whatever reason, the games were always like 6-5, 5-4, 6-3. Like, it's always a weirdly high-scoring game. And so I was expecting that. Uh, it was just, uh, was hoping more that the Flames would come out on the good end of it. And that uh, shootout goal by Rasmus Anderson was... a uh, good bit of uh, him noticing that Knight was not moving particularly fast laterally in the shootout and he certainly exploited that one with that game winner that was a a bit of a troll job on that you know like oh I'll just skate around you and then pop it in the open net thanks and good I was night. kind of surprised for the fifth skater that you put a defenseman in there like that was that was a little sh shocking to me when I watched Daryl's choice yeah, I, I'm sure that Raz probably chirped Sutter to say, hey, I think I might be able to end this. And Well, yeah. apparently what they were saying is, uh, and if you listen to Daryl after the game and a few of the other guys after the game, they said they practice this all the time, doing shootouts, and Raz is always really good at practicing shootouts, so that's why Daryl threw him in there. Makes sense. Well, certainly well, uh, with how... Um, good both the goalies were you needed an odd goal to win that one that was certainly a different looking goal by raz first shootout of the year yep and well, what uh I, I wanted to say that uh i thought it was interesting that nobody really paid too much attention to kachuk throughout the game other than markstrom in the shootout like you didn't see like people trying to fight him or engage in him in any way which uh, generally, if Matthew's uh, not um, emotionally invested via getting hit and mixing it up, he tends not to play very good. And I didn't think, other than that one tip in goal, that he played particularly well in that game. Yeah, I think that's fair. I don't know how he's looked the rest of the season, but I think that's fair for that game. Yeah, well, he's been good for Florida. He's one of the top scorers in the league. Well, right now, the Flames sit fifth in the Pacific Division. We should note that they've played less games than everyone else in the Pacific Division. They've played 17, and a bunch of other teams have played 18, so they will probably be behind just because of that. But right now, they're fifth at 18 points with eight wins, seven losses, two overtime losses. Um, and right above them is Edmonton at 20, then Seattle at 23, then LA at 24, and Vegas at 29 points. So we, we knew that that seven-game losing streak or six games, six-game losing streak was going to hurt them in the standings a little bit. But I feel like, based on what we're seeing, they're going to start climbing again. Well, and that's the thing. Um, this team, the fundamentals of this team is strong. Like, they do not surrender a ton of high-danger chances in the game. They get a lot of scoring opportunities themselves. It's just that everything, whether it's Markstrom allowing a lot of uncharacteristically soft goals or the team defense, you know, having breakdowns at key moments or not being able to protect the lead, like those things get ironed out over time. And if you look at the Flames' quality of opponents, the Flames have actually had the stiffest competition of any team in the entire NHL. Yeah, you mentioned that on a couple episodes. And it... it it's uh, one of those where, like, the average rank of the team that we're facing is, like, 14th, and, like, everybody else is, like, in 16th, 17th, 18th, you know, um, on their average opponent. And, like, that's a significant difference. Um, and, like, the Flames, from this point forward, actually have the easiest schedule in the NHL by a wide margin, too. So 
it's one of those where um like everything has kind of gone sideways to start the year like people adjusting to new systems all of the things that could possibly go wrong have and yet they're eight seven and two like two points out of fourth you know and only like and five points out of second adversity and i'm kind of and i've know i've said this before but i'm kind of glad the flames are facing it now as opposed to later yeah and you look ahead in like the schedules are for the next couple months after the six game road trip it's mostly easy peasy uh opponents where like the team like even if they are struggling should still win just due to talent differentials so it it's one of those like it, it's good that they're winning now but like as long as like they're not limping into december they should be a okay moving forward well, talking about being A-OK and sort of adjusting back to the norm or, you know, moving back to that normal, two questions I'll ask you at once. Um, first off, we've talked about the Flames needing a top four winger. Is Adam Rajishka that guy? And to go along with that, do you feel like the Flames finally have the right guys and the right line combos, or do you think that we're going to see some more shuffling here? Well, um, frankly... Uh Rajitska, when he was coming into the entry draft, he was kind of, like, before he was drafted, was kind of thought of as a possible first-round pick caliber prospect, but he was so wildly inconsistent that his stock dropped and he ended up going in the fourth round to us. And it's one of those things where the talent's always been there. It's just getting him to apply it consistency consistently has been the problem and it, it, could he be a high quality top six forward in the nhl definitely he has the skill set like he was projected to be a top 20 pick heading into his draft year and he just had a really abysmal draft season <laughs> um with much to our benefit but like he could emerge as a 60 70 point guy um it, but I guess it, for this season, like, you know, uh, yeah, if we just look at this year, uh, 2022, 2023, I don't think he becomes a 60 point guy this year. No, but I could see him fitting in that well on that line with Lindholm and Toffoli and being maybe a 50, 60 point guy. Like it, it it's okay, more so, his so uh, line down, mates so, more. So than, if, you, if you're looking at the lines, let's say we make the playoffs. Cause I think that's reasonable. Do you think that going into round one, Rajichka is still with Lindholm to Foley? Uh, that will depend on if Rajitska can figure out his consistency. Because, like, he's on a heater right now. He has seven points in his last four games. Like, no, that's not sustainable for anybody. But um, if he can consistently bounce off of uh Lindholm and uh to fully well and like that chemistry persists even if the production slows down and is a little bit more intermittent I think that line could be good enough especially with Rujitska being a six foot four 220 guy like he's not small by any means um that does help to create time and space for everybody else and uh you know it it's one of those where developmental programs, it's not a linear process. And Rajitska for right now is looking like he's taking off and that would be awesome for the flames. And he was on a fairly decent clip last season when he played uh, for generating points relative to being a third liner. Um, so, like, it's not out of the realm of possibility that he could. It's one of those that he might slow down 10 games from now and be mediocre, in which case then you swap things around. Or he could just be gangbusters and be awesome. It, 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 we can't really tell because there's just no back record uh, on him yet. Last year he played 28 NHL games, had five goals, five assists for 10 total points. I think, you know, honestly, I think that he's on a hot streak. I don't think that when we look at this team going forward this year and even into next year, you can you have enough, like you said, you don't have enough background to say, yes, 
Adam Rajichka is a is our solve on the top six. We can stop looking for that top six guy that we need. Um, I think I, that I, like regardless whether Rajitska is playing awesome in Gangbusters or not, um, like say we're in February and like Rajitska is producing at like a 50, 60 point pace and is looking great on that line still. I don't think that changes the calculus of the Flames still need more scoring help. No, but I think if you think that Rajishka is a, is a bona fide top four guy, what you're willing to give up to get that scoring help probably changes. Yeah, and you'd probably be more willing to accept um, a guy more on like the Gustav Nyquist, uh, Hoffman level. You know, instead of like the Patrick Kane or, you know, insert legit first liner type guy here. Yeah, I, yeah, I think if you think that Rujic is a top, let's call him a top four winger, I think then you're really looking to solve your bottom or let's call it your third pair wing. Yeah, well, e- like even um, like uh, with how Munjapane and Dubé have struggled a, a bit. Um, you know, even getting a second line winger and like, if you say, imagine Huberdo being on the second line with Kadri and insert name of new guy here and moving, uh, Majapane and Dubé down to the third and fourth lines, um, you know, and spreading the, the depth down that way. I think that would make more sense if, uh, Rajitska is able to hold on for the longer term. Um, I, frankly, I'm not too, too sure how long Huberdo's stay on the line with Backlund and Coleman will be. Um, I think that if Manjapani doesn't start turning it around, that, uh, those two will be swapped fairly soon. Before we get there, let's have that discussion as well, but just kind of finishing our thoughts on Rajishka. I really think that, and you're right. I mean, Rajishka has some upper end talent, but he hasn't shown it. And I don't think you can give you know, sort of a top four spot or even pencil the top four spot into a guy who hasn't shown that he can do that night in, night out, especially when we were just talking about one of the Flames Achilles heels is consistency. I really think next year, Rujicka and Dubé are going to be competing for the same spot on this team. Yeah, I could see that. I think they'll both be competing for that three emergency two wing spot. And maybe like an old Western movie, there just ain't enough room in this town for the both of them. Yeah, and that's one of those where, like, it really just depends. Like, in um, the last two seasons that um, Ruzitska played in uh, the minors, uh, he played 28 games in 2021 uh, with Stockton and had 21 points, 11 goals, and and 10 assists in 28 games. And then uh, had 11 goals and 9 assists uh, in 16 games uh, last year, which is why he got called up and played most of the season in Calgary. For once, uh, you didn't say it wrong. You're talking about the actual Stockton Heats. I know. The Calgary uh, Stockton Heats. Yes, exactly. Um, the Celsius so, version. So it, it's one of those where, like, in the AHL, like, he has proven that he is a reliably good scorer. And so it... It's one of those that I've seen a until, lot of guys though that were great HL scorers came to the NHL and topped out as third liners. Yeah, and that's one of those where, like, if you remember, like when TJ Brody first came up, like he was horrendously bad defensively for a long time, and then it clicked, and then he became a top pairing defenseman and still is. And it's one of those you you don't really know, and you kind of have to just play it by ear with young guys because like the what they are is still a big question mark. And well, on the other side of Brody, I mean, and I hate to compare these two players, but you know who looked really hot when they first called him up in two thousand six, two thousand seven? David Moss. Yeah. Oh, and, I know. I mean, you know, he served. He played in the league till fourteen fifteen as a okay National Hockey League player. Yeah. And I think you that's know, one of no, those no where. One would have, no one thought Moss was going to be a top two, you know, or top top two line or top four winger. But, you know, he and I think Rajishka, like him, can make a good living in the National Hockey League. I just don't know that he's going to be a top four winger on a playoff team. No, and that's one of those where, like, I think that Rajitska's floor will be more or less what David Moss was. Uh, like that solid, big, 
defensively okay guy who can chip in a little bit here and there. Um, but the potential for the offensive side to be more is also there. And, you know, like literally we do not have the playbook on him enough uh, at the professional level to know yet. And, you know, like David Moss did score 20 goals that one year. And, you know, like there was thought that, oh, well, maybe there's more there. There wasn't. It, Rajitska, like right now, he's doing great. Is there more there? Who knows? And I think that, like, that's the important thing to watch over the next couple months because just the matter of playing games will really show, like, is Rajitska legitly good or, you know, not? He's just on a heater and a decent middle of the lineup guy instead. And I, I really think that to find that out, we also need to separate him from that top line. Like I think there's a lot of guys that could look good there. And I think this is almost the Mark Giordano syndrome. We had a lot of guys that played with geo and maybe looked better than they should have. I think you could put Brett Ritchie with Lindholm and Defoley and he looked better than he should. I think you could put Lewis there. So I think, you know, if we really want to see what Rajishka is, maybe we need to put him with, Kadri and Mon and Monjapani, or you know, with Backlund and Coleman, and sort of, you know, see if he still performs the way he's expected to with with oh, different I responsibilities. And I in the and I think that like as he struggles at some point, because that will happen. I think that that's when you um, switch things up and see, you know, like if you can get him going with Kadri instead. Um, but you know, I think you just kind of ride it while he's flying high and see how it goes. And sometimes that just sticks. Like, uh, when Andre Palat came into the league, he was kind of in that same boat of like, nobody really knew what he was. And then all of a sudden, like he got put up on the top six and on Tampa Bay and became one of their best players and stayed there for a long time and won cups with them and was a pivotal player for that team and it, it we just don't know frankly like could Rajitska emerge as a top line forward sure just like any other guy and like he does have pedigree enough that that's not an insane thing to say no but, but at the same <sighs> time the fact that inconsistency has plagued him for so much of his career um, I the, don't. The, I, yeah. I don't know that that changes now. And it, it's one of those things that, like consistency, like if players are able to overcome that and like find their way mentally around their consistency issues, um, that I think that that's where they can, like, fully emerge as that top tier guy. Um, and like For sure, Rajitska, I don't disagree, but I guess my question is what, and maybe the only evidence is the fact he stayed here all year, but well, the uh, fact Rajitska, that it's been such a knock against Rajitska since junior. Well, one of the main things that uh, Rajitska, like when he was a junior player, he did not play with any physicality whatsoever. And like he just didn't engage. And that's part of the reason why he was so inconsistent because like he just wasn't engaged in the play and like goals and assists just kind of happened sporadically when he was out there because the skill level's there. But since he's turned pro, I like watching a few games when he was with Stockton and then like since he's been here, like he does fight in the corners for pucks. He does engage physically with the defenseman and will actually deliver hits not you know like he's not gonna bowl people over left right and center but like he doesn't shy away from that where he did when he was younger and like even when he was with Stockton like there were times when he was inconsistent but it was not the same degree as when he was in juniors and like when he's been with Calgary it's a little lesser even than it was when he was with Stockton and it it's still an issue uh, but it seems like as he's maturing he's getting through that and i think that's due in large part to both his work and the coaching staff 
Uh, cause you, you definitely know that, that uh, Daryl's not going to <laughs> be too kindly if somebody's dogging it. No. And the fact that Adam is still here and stayed here after camp and wasn't moved or waved, I think says that Daryl had some faith in him as well, which didn't seem to be the case last year. I mean, there's a lot of other guys, um, who, you know, I would say maybe coming out of camp, we thought might have been a better fit there, especially, and I've always been somebody who said, don't have a young guy as your number 13, but they kept Rajishka, and I think, like you said, there was Daryl having faith there in, well, you know, this guy is, this this guy is the, the guy we want here, and the guy we can see being a regular on this team. Yeah, and, you know, like watching him in the morning skates and all of that, um, like his effort level would have shown that like, yeah, I am present. I am wanting a spot on the roster and, you know, and that's why I, like, I think that when, um, Huberto left the lineup that it, it seemed to be just that, well, you know, you, here's a reward for your efforts in, you know, that you've been doing while not in the lineup. Here's an opportunity. And like Daryl said with, uh, Connor Mackey, like, you know, if you're given an opportunity, you got to run with it or you're not going to get necessarily the same level of opportunities. And okay, Rajit's go. Uber goes out, have fun, you know, and to his credit, he's taken that baton and run with it, at least thus far. How far is endurance <laughs> level before, you know, returning to, you know, whatever we'll see and it, it's just I, like i'm grateful that uh daryl gave him an opportunity on the first line and i'm happy to see that he's taking advantage of it and just looking forward to seeing where this one goes because it would be a huge boon to the team if rajitska actually develops into a top six forward well, let's go to the other half of my question here. Do you think when we look at this lineup now and the fact the Flames are having some modicum of success with it, that the lineup we're seeing is, let's call it, the lineup for the remainder of the season? Or do you think that there's still more tweaks to do? And if so, what would the final lineup look like to you? Well, I'm assuming that uh, Huberdeau on the, the line with Backland is temporary just so that way Huberdeau can get more comfortable with the Flames system and style of play. Um, and to his credit, he has looked a lot better since being with Backlund than when he was with any of his other line mates previous to this. And uh, so, like, I'm kind of assuming that, like, he'll either rejoin the Lindholm line if Rajitska fal falters at all, or he'll uh, take Manjapane's spot uh, on the second line with Kadri if Rajitska is just carrying on being awesome. Yeah, see, and that's, and that's the thing. Like, it feels like right now we've got Lindholm who's do, doing really well. It feels like we've got Kadri's doing really well, and all the other forwards are just kind of treading water. And I guess Rajishka is doing well too. Um, I think, you know, ideally, I think my my probably line I would try would be Manjapani, Lindholm, Defoli, and then Huberto, Kadri, and somebody, I don't want to say Dubé. Maybe that's where, again, they're still missing somebody. Well, I guess it would be Rajichka in that case yeah. um, if he's going to stay in the top six. But if they want to keep that top line together, then I think your your second line becomes Huberto, Kadri, Manjapani. But, like, you know, Manjapani's not really going the way we need him to. Arguably, Dubé's not really going the way we need him to. We can't keep putting Lewis, Richie, and, and Lucic onto that second line. I know, and, like, the Flames legitimately do need a top nine forward, regardless of whether Rajitska remains good or falters. Like, I think that, like, they will still need, you know, because, like, worst case scenario is if they go get another high-quality forward, is that, like, Dubé, Manjapane, or Coleman gets put on the fourth line and instantly makes the fourth line one of the best fourth lines in the NHL. And it's like, that's not really the problem, uh, a problem for this team. You know, like if say you, you make Dubé the fourth line center, uh, with Lucic and Richie or, you know, insert whomever, you know, like that's a really good fourth line. So it, it it's one of those where 
like because like the Flames' ultimate goal is winning the Stanley Cup, I think you need to like stack the deck with as many talented players as you can. And I think that like right now, even with Ruzhitska, it looks like they have eight out of nine in the top nine, and I think they still will need one more good player. The level of that guy depends on, you know, if Ruzhitska's doing well or if the other guys step up or not. But yeah, yeah I mean, you know, I, I I like the idea of splitting up our. Let's just say that any line with Lindholm on it, I think, becomes your top line. Like I think yeah. Lindholm is your number one center right now. Yeah, and Kadri is number two, and like those are your two primary scoring lines, and Backlund's your shutdown line, regardless yeah, so of I, who the wingers are. So I don't really mind, you know, let's call it pairs of Lindholm to Foley, Kadri, Huberto, Backlund, Coleman. Yeah. Being your pairs. And then you've just got to find the right wingers for those pairs. And I think Dubé fits the best on the Backlund line. Yep. I agree. I think. Manjapane could pro- fit on the second line. I think, I mean, I think in an ideal world, if everyone is producing the way they should be, I think Manjapani fits best with Lindholm and Defoley, just play style wise. Yeah. And I think then Rajishka, Kadri, and Huberdo, based on what we're seeing now, becomes your second line. But again, it's it's relying on, at that point, Rajishka to be playing well. Yeah. And that's one of those where, like, if. Um... Well, well, like if you look at um, whether it was Lindholm with Kachuk or Lindholm previously with whomever on the right side with Gaudreau, um, they would need one player to be able to get the puck behind the net and like get it out front to Lindholm or Kachuk or whomever. And usually that was Gaudreau, and he would feed passes all the time for Lindholm for the one timer in front of the net, and. Like, we're seeing that Ruzhitska is adequately filling the role of going and getting the puck behind the net and passing it. Um, now, and that's what, why I think if, whether, if he can be that, that puck mover, yeah, Andre and, and Huberto together could, could do a lot more with him, yeah. And that's where, like, if, um, like, if the Flames, uh, like, if Ruzhitska does not fit the bill their long term on that line the flames will need i think somebody of a similar play style to rujitska or gaudreau of being able to go and get the puck behind the net and make passes uh to set up the two and shooters I think that's what sutter was hoping lucic was going to do when he put him with kadri but lucic yeah. over his head there yeah, well, Lucic is having a really dynamite season because his foot speed has improved, and it, a lot of his regression down the rosters uh, over the last half decade has the, been to the decline of his foot speed more than anything. And, like, he does create a lot of time and space for other people just because he's a, a literal freight train. Uh, so, uh, it. You know, having him on the second line hasn't been the worst idea, um, and he's played well. I, I've thought for a lot of the times that he's filled in on that line, he was actually quite effective, even though the points were coming. He's short-term solution. Yeah, I agree. Um, and I could even see Lucic, Backlund, Coleman being a line at some point. Yeah, it, and the, like this is the overarching problem with the team is that because like the chemistry isn't quite set in stone with everybody yet and it becoming apparent visually that like there seems to be the the need for one more good talented forward that like everything's just a little off still and well and so you know we've talked about that needing that extra forward and talking about the chemistry this team is finally going to start clicking soon the last thing you probably want to do then is disturb the chemistry more by bringing in a new guy. Like I understand, you know, you can't make a trade if you don't have a partner, but you've almost got to bring that guy in soon so that he can work through the chemistry with the rest of the guys, I think. Yeah. And I'm going to make a weird suggestion. And I think that the player that would most be able to fix the problem internally would actually be Matthew Phillips. Um, Phillips last week. Yeah. Um, Seeing more of uh, his play style, um, like with the Wranglers and 
uh, how like he has specifically been playing this season. Um, his overall creativity, like he's, I think getting to the point where, because he is one of the top guys in the AHL that, and the flames needing some dynamic scoring ability, um, that, you know, get, just like with Ruzitska getting the shot on the first line, giving, uh, Phillips a shot in the NHL, um, because both guys are mature now, like Phillips is 25, Ruzitska is 23, um, like they're basically, like, they need to be in the NHL to show off what they can do, and, you know, uh, like, frankly, like, right now, uh, through till January, February is basically the perfect time, like over the next couple of weeks for the flames to recall Phillips to see what he has. If he can be that guy possibly as an internal solution, instead of needing to go outside the organization. Yeah. And again, I mean, he's looking great in the AHL. I'm not convinced you bring him in and he becomes your immediate top four winger. And I guess my other question then is who comes out of the lineup if he goes in? Well, what I'm figuring that, because uh, he's a right shooting right winger, um, that you throw Huber, Doe, Caudry, and Phillips on the second line together, um, which takes a lot of responsibility off of Phillips to be the guy on his line because those other two guys are high-quality veteran, defensively responsible players, so... Phillips gets a little bit more freedom to kind of just be doing Phillips thing. Um, and then you move Mangiapane down to the third line with uh, Coleman and uh, Backland, and move Dubé down to the fourth line center spot and move Lewis out of the lineup and have like Richie, Rooney, and Lewis just alternate as like the thir 12th, 13th, and 14th forwards. Yeah, I think I think for a couple games that would work. Again, I don't think you can call and, him up and assume he's staying here for long term, but give him yeah. a couple games, see how it works. Yeah, it's one of those like especially with how many games the Flames are playing in December, like it's one of those where because he's a group six free agent at the end of the year. Um, for those that don't know, what does it mean to be a group six free agent? Uh, he hasn't played enough games in Calgary for the flames to be able to hold his rights, even though technically like if he had played enough, uh, he would be an RFA, uh, due to his age, but, uh, he gets to go He's be a, a free, agent. free agent. So he becomes yeah. unrestricted. Yeah. So like technically the flames will lose him on July 1st, this upcoming year. So and it, it's one of those because he's dominating the AHL to such a high extent, and he is a very cerebrally good offensive player. You're like, yeah, he's tiny, and like that is a huge drawback, and that is literally the only reason why he's not in the NHL. Well, now that Kachuk's gone, we gotta, or sorry, now that Goudreau's gone, we gotta bring our average height back down. Exactly, and <laughs> um, it's one of those where the cheap option would be to try Phillips out. And, and they can Phillips, afford him right now. As of and, now, the Flames have 880 in cap space, and he's 750. Yeah, it's one of those where if he comes in and takes off like gangbusters and say like the Phillips with Huberdo and Caudry line takes off and they're awesome, great. Now you don't have to go waste assets to go get a second line forward because Phillips will do the job. And if Phillips comes in and, frankly, he sucks... That's also good because you know you don't need to sign them in the off season, and you you'll still know that you need to go get that second line forward. And I think that like both the team and the player uh, need, I think this um, question of what Phillips is at the yeah. NHL level to be answered sooner than later. And maybe he doesn't suck, but maybe you just realize he's not second line material. Yeah, and in which case, that's also fine, because you'll know, okay, well, we don't need a five foot six fourth line guy. 
And, you know, like he might ha be able to carve a career for himself elsewhere on a lesser competitive team. But like for where we're at, that just doesn't make sense. And based on the lineup you talked about just a minute ago, I think the other thing that does there is that sends a bit of a signal to Manjapani. You're making 5.8 and we're putting you on the third line. Like you've got to fight your way back up. This kid from the farm just came up and took your spot. Yeah. And that's also another reason why I... I'm leaning towards, like, that would be a good idea to get that done sooner than later, especially because of how, frankly, poor both Manjapane and Dubé have been this year. Like, they have severely... You know, I, I still maintain, I think, Dubé's upside as a Calgary Flame is as a third-line winger. Yeah, but, like, you look at Manjapane, like, if you extrapolate his production, like, the this is... His worst production since like eighteen nineteen, when he was in his first year in as a flame, like you know, like he's on pace for like ten goals right now, and like that's just not acceptable. <laughs> no, but I mean, when I, I agree that he's disappointing, but to me, Dubé, we're playing him over his head. We're getting what I think we should be getting out of Dubé. Yeah. Uh, cool, definitely closer um, with uh, Dylan, uh, but even then, like he's only on pace for like twenty points, which that's not really up to his par either. So no, but it, but I mean, you know, if, if Dylan's playing the lineup ahead of Huberto, put Dylan back on the third line, and I think once Dylan, we found I or at least I've seen is a guy who needs some consistency, needs consistent line mates to do well. Yeah, I agree. And I think if you can strap him to that third line and say, these are your guys, I think he'll do better. I, I think, you know, 2025 is probably career-wise going forward as a third-line winger, a good number for him. Yeah, I agree. Um, it, it's just like uh, last year he showed the potential of more, and, you know, and, like, that's where the disappointment with Dubé has been is that, like, he showed more, especially at the end of the season. And, like, literally none of that has materialized this year. Um, frankly, he's even looking poorer than he did in the early part of last year where he was very kind of bad. <laughs> so. But, you know, if we look at most third-line centers on good teams, I would say that most of them, though, have those hints. They have a, a year where they look good, and then the team says, wow, we'll keep this guy around, and then they don't look as good. And then, you know, they look good again, and someone else picks them up. Like, I think to stay in the NHL for more than three, four years as a third-line guy, you've got to have those sort of glimpses. Yeah, true enough. Right? Otherwise, there's always somebody younger, cheaper, who the team will bring in. Yeah. And, yeah. And it's one of those things that, like, I think both of those guys kind of need a shot in their ego a bit to, you know, like, you're, yeah, okay, you're established NHL players, but now you got to actually show that you're worth playing over guys like, you know, Ruzitska and Phillips, who, you know, like, if they come in and steal your money, lunch money, well, that's on you for not playing well. And, you know... A name that you mentioned earlier, Kevin Rooney. I'm surprised he's been out of the lineup as much as he has. How about you? Um, He is the quintessential... He's also their guy. Like he, like when he was with the New York Rangers, he wasn't bad. He wasn't great. He was just a player that, like, not a ton happened when he was on the ice. And he's big and he engages physically enough where, like, that none of that's, you know, unsurprising. It's just, he, you know, like. There's not like his level of offensive ability is just really underwhelming. Uh, where the rest of his game shows that like he should be better than what he is, but that just non existent offensive ability is what holds him back. Well, and I think in when I look at this lineup and where I think he fits into it, he's not the centerman I want playing with Lucic and Richie or Lucic and Lewis, but I, I think that he's the next guy, but yet Backlund's got that spot sort of on the third line, which is where I thought we'd probably see um, before they signed Kadri. I thought that's exactly where we were going to see Rooney this year. So I think Rooney, they got to find a spot for him. And it's an, it's still early in the season. I think at some point we'll be down a centerman 
and we're going to be really happy that we have Rooney oh, as yeah. a reliable NHL guy to fill in for a couple weeks. Yeah, I agree. And like when the Flames uh, brought Lewis, Richie, and him in uh, this year, like it, I was kind of figuring that they would rotate in the lineup between the three of them as the 11, 12, 13 guys. And, uh, you know, and it's... And I think Rooney can be sort of the forward version of what Michael Stone has been in years past. I mean, uh, he can be that guy that no matter how many games he sits out, he'll be ready and reliable to come into the lineup. Yeah, and that's exactly what I was thinking, too. Like, just, he's there. And he'll come in, do his job, be good at it. Cool. Like, not anything great, not anything bad, just adequate. And, like, what you need, you, how do you say, if you're noticing your fourth-line players, usually that's a very, very bad thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, if you're not paying attention to Rooney, that's actually good. <laughs> It was once said to me that noticing a fourth-line player is sort of like the principal knowing your name in high school. It's either because you're really good or really bad. Mm. Yeah, and especially in like a guy like Rooney's case, you, you don't want to be noticed. It's just like uh, Gilbert yesterday. Other than the fight, didn't really notice him, which, you know, he was decent defensively. He didn't really make too many glaring mistakes, and he got into that fight. You know, and like I thought he had a solid game against Florida, so... You know, that, that's kind of what you need from your, like, end of lineup guys is mm -hmm. just to be come be able to come in, play your minutes, do okay, and not dangerously harm the team. So, Matt, we were talking about guys that we're noticing and, you know, noticing for a good reason. I think one of them is Nikita Zadorov. We've been noticing him for the right reasons this past week. And often we notice Zadorov for the wrong reasons. He's often fumbling coverage or something like that. And he, the coaching staff has seen enough in him that they put him on the second pair with Uyghur, which is drop 10 after the third pair. Talking about where we think guys are going to even out and where they're going to be long term, um, I don't see Tanev being on the third pair long term. What I think is going to happen, honestly, is Tanev will be moved back to the second pair when we get another defenseman healthy. But I think Tanev is the right guy to anchor Dennis Gilbert for now and keep him sort of above water, if you will. But I think that I think eventually you're going to see Tanev Weger become the second pair, and then Zadorov and whoever is the third pair. Yeah, um, honestly, I would not be opposed to just kind of leaving things as is for even the longer term, even when guys like Stone return, uh, just due to the fact that um, Zadorov seems to be taking a bit of a step this year, and he took a massive step last year from where he was with Chicago or Colorado. Like he was exceptionally bad defensively with those two teams and basically only played because he big, he hit, you go down. And it's one of those things where like he's actually now emerging as a high quality defensive defenseman in addition to being able to jump up in the play and he's scored four goals already, which is and very impressive for him and he's entering he's 27 now which is basically when defensemen start to take off um like we saw um giordano um it, it wasn't really until he was 27 28 before he became as high quality of a defenseman that he became and uh, like Zadorov is a former first round pick, uh, 16th overall by the Buffalo Sabres. Uh, so like there was a, enough talent there to be drafted in the middle of a first round. And could he easily become a top four defenseman? Definitely. And he's played at that level thus far. Um, it, it's one of those things that like, as you mentioned with Tanev, like, do you put him, keep him on the third line? It's one of those where, you know, if that's the case, it's like, oh, no, we have the best defense in the NHL. The, I think you know. <laughs> right now that fourth spot is Zadorov to lose. Like you said, yeah. he's taking a step. He's doing well. I think he's still going to make some boneheaded mistakes because I think that's who he is as a defenseman. But I think as long as he can play well, yeah, I have no problem keeping him on that second pairing. And I think Tanev on the third gives us more depth. Um, but I, again, I, I, I just don't know, sort of like the Rajishka argument. 
I just don't know that Zadorov is ready for that quite yet. And it's one of those where in both of their case, like there are still young players and you know, like even Rajitska who's been playing in the NHL for eight years now, he's still a young Not player. Not Rajitska, Zadorov. Or Zadorov, pardon me. He's been in the NHL for eight years. It, it, he's still a young player and it's one of well, those. It's, it's almost a Hannafin conundrum in that way too, right? Yeah, the, like Hannafin. You look at him and Anderson; they're the same age, and yet, you know, everybody thinks, "Oh, well, Hannafin's the veteran, while Anderson's the young guy." And it's like, um, new. No. Uh, so by games played, he sure is. Yeah, definitely. But um, you know, Zadorov, he, you know, it, it's one of those where. Uh, his ceiling hasn't been hit yet and you know he he's still learning and like that's part of the reason why he came back to play for the flames when he got uh good branson's offer from columbus the four million to four year deal um actually that's why they signed good branson was because the door off turned him down and he came back here for two years uh, because you know he was in the right spot and i think that uh with daryl and the Flames coaching staff, he has looked a lot better. Like last year, you didn't see him making a ton of glaring mistakes defensively, especially compared to when he was with Chicago and Colorado. Like he was a tire fire defensively with those teams. And, you know, like now he, you know, he's looking like a high quality defensive defenseman. Who's also six foot six, two fifty, and hits like a freight train. So we'll see. Uh, I'm happy <laughs> with everything he's doing, and it's like, please do more. Yeah, be awesome. It's his spot to lose. <laughs> yeah, be awesome. Keep going. <laughs> you know, there's nothing wrong with what you're doing. Keep going. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And, and I think the Flames paid him for that potential this year. Yeah, and hopefully he materializes and like that would be an amazing player for this team over the long term if he really emerged as a high quality you know because basically if that's the case then you more or less have like Zidane Chara light on your team which yeah I think every team in the NHL is like yep yeah, yes please yeah I, w I would take that <laughs> so you know we'll see before we get to uh, before we get to looking at the week that's coming, any other flame stuff you want to talk about, Matt? Uh, it it'll be just interesting to see exactly where this team goes as the quality of the competition uh, starts to wind down. But not necessarily this week, but like in the coming weeks uh, when we head into December, uh, can they start getting results? more so um and keep up their effort levels um it'll just be interesting to see because you know the team like especially over the last five or six games looks like they're putting things together it's like uh can we see more now and hopefully that's the case and you know because being 500 kind of sucks right now it does before we talk about the week that's coming, I just wanted to give the Flames props here. Um, how do I say this politely? This is a team that will usually take whatever angle they can to make money. And I get it. They're a business. They've got to do that. I was watching some clips of the um, of the Toronto Maple Leafs today with their milk logo on their jersey. And I have to give the Flames credit for not putting a logo on the jersey this year. I can't imagine they didn't have the option. I can't imagine Scotia or somebody didn't come to them and do it. Oh, I'm sure that, you know, it's just like uh, how they were supposed to have a sponsor on their helmets last year. And they're like, yeah, no, we're good, thanks. Well, I think they had Scotiabank on there last year on the sides. Um, not all season. Uh, like, the, I, they probably did, but uh, at certain points they didn't. And, cause and I remember Scotiabank them is, having... Scotiabank's there's... logo fits in so well with our look, too, our colors and that sort of thing. Yeah. But, um, yeah, no, I agree. And, like, seeing Montreal's jerseys with the, the stupid advertisement, it's just, like, that's horrendous. 
Yeah, so I just wanted to, you know, I think a lot of fans, especially Flames fans, think that the Flames' uh, current home and away jerseys are some of the nicest in the league. And I just wanted to give the Flames props for that, that, you know, they're, they're keeping those jerseys as clean as they can and giving the fans what they're used to and not putting that ad on the jersey. Yeah, and like it, from a purely, purely financial standpoint, yeah, it sucks to be losing out on probably a million dollars or two million or whatever revenue but it's also like frankly like once this um the nhl recovers from the losses from covid and like the cap starts increasing again like i'm really hoping that they go away from like the betting advertisements and like the advertisements on the jerseys and once you're making the money though it's hard to say no to it I know, and that's why, like, I'm glad that the Flames aren't uh, stepping in and, like, making it normalized so that, you know, like, if when, you know, like, in, like, two or three years when that's all equalized, that they can just say, yeah, we don't really want that. And I was kind of expecting there would be one on the on the reverse retro when they unveiled it or the Blasty. Like, those were new jerseys, and I could have seen them saying, we're not going to put them on the home and away kit, but we'll put them on the new jerseys, so... Yeah, credit to them that they haven't done that. Hopefully they can stay without it, like you said, until they can find a way to recover some of that revenue. Yeah, and, you know, the NHL is recovering quite well from all the lost revenue from that one season, but it's, you know, still going to be a ways away on that. Well, let's, uh, let's play our prediction game. You're catching up to me. We're now tied. It's sort of like the Florida game. Uh, you predicted last week correctly. You thought we'd beat L.A. and Florida and lose to Tampa Bay. I thought we'd win in L.A. and lose the other two. So we're tied 2-2. So, Matt, this week is our overtime. Yay. Calgary has four games this week. It's going to be a busy, busy week on the road for the Flames. These are all early games, so make sure you're setting your, your calendar accordingly or your time accordingly and make sure... Uh, you have your excuses ready for work because you're going to need them. Monday night, we're at Philadelphia, 5 p.m. start time. Then Wednesday, we're at Pittsburgh, 5 p.m. start time. Um, and then Friday is at 12 p.m. start time. Remember, that's American Thanksgiving, so that's why they're starting early there. Black Friday, I guess. And then they have a back-to-back, and that's Saturday at Carolina, 2 p.m. start time. So two early and two afternoon games. What do you think? You go ahead first this time. All right. Let me take a look at these. Um, I think after the game that they played with Florida, I think they'll beat. I think that they will beat Philly. I think they'll beat Pittsburgh. The last two are the ones that are hard for me to predict. I don't think they're going to beat Carolina, but I'm, I'm a toss up on Washington. I'll be optimistic and I'll say they'll beat Philly, Pittsburgh, Washington, and not Carolina. I'm going to go a little bit different and go with win, 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 win this week. I think this is the start of a five-game win streak for them. So you think they start with these and then they end it with Florida at home on the 29th? Yeah. Well, uh, the I'm counting the Florida game that oh, we just okay. played as the first of the five. Okay. But, um, no, I, I think this team is uh, starting to get it's like what Peter Marr said where like teams uh, lose before they start to lose games when they're on a winning streak and they start winning games before they win games on a losing streak. The Flames, I think, are doing a lot more of all of the right things and are being less mistake-prone, and I think that things are starting to click better overall. I agree. And uh, that's why I'm like, yeah, I think they're going to go on a bit of a run this week. Where do you play Dan Vladar, if at all? Um, honestly, I have zero idea on that. I'm assuming the Washington game. Washington Carolina is a back to back. I think with all the travel and the back to back, I think Washington's where I'd put him in too. Yeah, I think you want to keep Markstrom in to build both him and the team for at least the first two. Yeah, it's one of those that be, and like this is um, equally correct for all of the Western Canadian teams. You have to ride your starting goalie until he figures it out, whether it's Thatcher Demko, whether it's uh, Campbell up north, or it's. And we're seeing that Markstrom still has some things to figure out this year. Yeah, and like all three have been bad this year. Like 
Demko has been laughably horrendous, actually, for Vancouver. But, um, you know, like all three of those guys are better than what they've shown thus far this season. And they, they just need to work it out. And, you know, like I've, I've seen online, like some people saying, oh, throw Vladar in for like four or five games. And, it, you know, they could do that. But I don't also think it's fair to Vladar, frankly, for the quality of opponents that are coming up. Not unless you're trying to get him to win the job. Yeah. If you hey. think that Jacob's not having a good year and you're trying to establish a new number one, then that might be what you do. Yeah. And even then, it might be you ride the three-headed monster and recall Wolf, too, at that point. Like, if you're... Uh, yeah, I don't know. It, it's one of those where, like... If things have gone off, that I think much with the, the way rails, Vladar is playing, you give Vladar yeah. the first crack at that. I agree. It's just one of those what with like, if Markstrom is off the rails entirely, then you know, you get into desperation mode at that point, and you know, yeah, it, it, I don't think that'll ever come to no. pass. But it's, I don't say never. I don't think this year. Yeah, I think there will definitely be a year in the future looking at Markstrom's age and his contract length that he won't be number one and. I think we, you know, we might be starting to see maybe the the regression there, but I, I think this year he's still the the bona fide number one. Yeah, and you know, like he tends throughout his career to have a good year and then a sort of meh year, then a good year, then a meh year, and you know, hopefully that doesn't last and like carry on. But um, we'll see. It, it, it's he's a interesting goaltender and you know like last year he was one of the best goalies in the nhl the runner up for the vesna if he can even get back to his like career average of like 2.7 goals against average uh instead of over three that would be a huge improvement for the team and yeah, it's just tough when it's like pretty much every game he's giving up one or more really bad goals that like should be basic saves. So, you know. Well, let's see how he does on this road trip, and we will see if there's anything to report back next week. Yeah, and like I'm just hoping that whatever it is that's causing him the issues, that he can work that out sooner than later. Because, like, frankly, like if he starts playing like he did last year, uh, with any sort of consistency, like this team's gonna win like seven or eight out of every ten games. Like they will just m murder other teams. It's just one of those where, like the fl Flames being eight, seven, and two, like uh, it shows how good the rest of the team as a team has played. Where like Markstrom has been legitimately one of the worst goalies in the NHL, and yet we're still like technically one game above 500 despite all of that so well, let's let's chat more about markstrom next week after we see how he does on this road trip yep and as always go flames go fireside chat is hosted by dan stevenson co-hosted by matt deborg this episode produced and edited by peter marino fireside chat is licensed under creative commons license for full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.